Welcome to the REI Rookies Podcast. Real Estate Investing Rookies Podcast, episode number two, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Josh Koth. And I'm Jack Haas. So uh, last week, we uh, talked about me and why we went through or why I jumped into real estate. Now we're going to do the same with Josh. Oh, yes. So I feel good about it. Do you? Yep. And just to kind of reiterate to our newer listeners, which is everyone since this is episode two, um, the whole point of this podcast is we have sat around so many times and and shared information and consumed tons of other educational information. And we just thought it would be so great to share kind of our journey as we admittedly don't know a ton of stuff yet, and we're learning and just starting up. We're rookies. That's why we call the podcast REI Rookies Podcast, Real Estate Investing Rookies. So we're new at it. We've been doing it a year or less, both of us. So we thought that would be great to share a lot of this information as we learn and, and you know, have a mistakes upon mistakes happen over and over again and we adjust our strategy and everything else so that's kind of the overall purpose of this podcast and one of the main things that uh, i found helpful um, is to you have to have your mindset right Um, that's where everything starts right right jack wouldn't you agree oh yeah and and i think the last time we talked about uh rich dad poor dad getting Mm -hmm. into that proper mindset yep but uh, what do you say would kind of started your path towards real estate? Well, for me, it was kind of a long journey. My uncle had about five properties when I was growing up, and I would help him mow those, shovel the snow, um, and do repairs. And you know, he would take me along for a week when I'd be up visiting to help him do a bunch of repairs. When I was like ten years old, at the end of the week, he'd buy me a baseball glove or something. But I got to see, I got to see it in action. So it kind of prepped me for, wow, this is this is something that people do. You can own places that people live in, and they pay you money for it. So I always knew it was a, an option. So that I kind of had a little head start there. Um, so then when I was about thirty, I bought my first house down at a, about four hours away from where we live now, down in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, I I got I got a hold of some Carlton Sheets tapes. Remember him, Carlton Sheets? The name's familiar. He was a one of these late night infomercial guys, and it was no money down real estate. It was you know the a typical you know the hard sell. You know you'll be on the beach uh, drinking a martini with with an umbrella in it. You know if you just follow his system. So I actually had it on cassette. I borrowed it from somebody. <clears throat> And I remember being working out in my yard with a boombox on the steps, playing those tapes, and it was completely over my head. Didn't know what I was doing, um, but I just knew that you know there was something there. So I actually, you know, we made good friends with a real estate agent down there, and he helped me look for my first rental. But keep in mind, I knew nothing. I had no concept of how the business really worked at all. And but I actually bought a place. It was I remember it was like for about eighty grand or so. It's a little two bedroom by a park. Um, and I did literally everything wrong. I didn't run the numbers properly. They were way off. I, I would love to go back and run the numbers now and see how off I am or I was back then, knowing what I know now. I literally took the first tenant that called and put him in there. <laughs> it was just a disaster. And then the place flooded the week of my wedding um, after I'd owned it about two months. The basement flooded. It was a finished basement, so it was just a complete nightmare. Uh, lost money, you know, hand over fist right out of the gate. Luckily, when I moved up here to Fargo, North Dakota, where we both live, I uh, sold it and got off from under it without doing any major t- financial damage. But, you know, even though that was a horrible experience and I just didn't know anything about it, I learned a lot, and that was the great thing, you know. And here we are, twelve, thirteen years later. I, you know, decided through just various career choices and things that I wasn't satisfied with where I was. Um, you know, I'd just been working in the cubicle, um, you know, just sl- slaving away and doing IT, and I was looking at my IRA and my four hundred one k, and just going, "Wow, this, there's no way I'm gonna." make it. And I had a pretty substantial amount of money set, set aside too. I felt like I was way past your average person at my age. And I still was running the numbers, realizing I wasn't going to get there. I was going to probably have to work till I was 70, 75. 
Um, so I knew something had to change. So then, you know, just like you spoke about in the last episode, you're searching for answers. How can you, you know, do something different to accelerate that, that progress? So, you know, I kind of went back to real estate. I found it again. I, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad a few years ago, got um, just the spark relit again, um, and read his other book, Cashflow Quadrant, which we'll talk about a little bit later too, which is another great. Um, and that really solidified it for me because <clears throat> he talks about active income versus passive income. And, you know, when you're working a regular nine to five job, it's all active income. You, you're trading your time for money, right? So, the only way to make more money is make more money per hour, but there's a cap on that unless you're just making an outrageously high income, which most people aren't ever going to see. So there's no way to ever step away from that and have that money keep coming in. And, you know, you just do your research and you say, well, okay, well, who is producing passive income? And everyone that's doing it, unless you, in, you know, uh, are Paul McCartney and you have just a stream of royalties coming in from music sales, you know, but I consider that like the the point zero zero one percent lottery winner type, you know, activities. That's very rare, very hard to do as a regular person. But the people that are doing it and producing the high levels of passive income, they're almost all in real estate, at least everyone I knew. Um, <clears throat> so that really just lit the fire again. So what I did was I found some people that were doing it here locally, um, hooked up with them, made friends, was in a networking group, just, you know, picked their brain, figured out, is it possible to do here locally? Um, and it, it is, and it was. And uh, so I found a really key point is to surround yourself with people that are like-minded, have the same goals, want to produce passive income, want to grow their wealth. And you, you realize that it's possible in a big thing for me was being confident enough in my own, you know, goals in my own, the direction I was heading to ignore all the naysayers, because that's a big one, right? You tell people, well, I'm going to invest in real estate. And they say things like, well, what about what if the market crashes? Oh, you're going to lose everything. Isn't that risky? What happens when tenants call at two in the morning, the, t the toilet's plugged up, um, you know, and my response is, well, I'm I mean, there's hardships and ups and downs in every type of career, but if one of them is going to lead me to financial freedom, I'm willing to endure some hardships to achieve that goal, right? So, <clears throat> you know, I still had the, the Carlton Sheet stuff in the back of my mind. I had my horrible experience from 12 years ago buying the rental that failed, uh, you know, in my mind. But I thought, well, I'm just going to educate myself. So that's really what I did was I just found tons of podcasts, books. Um, all things about setting your mindset, you know, and just getting in the right frame of mind. So I just really devoured a lot of that. And really then the key moment for me was when I got fired. My whole team got fired. Jack and I worked together. Right, Jack? That was fun, right? Yeah, that was an interesting day. <laughs> yeah, so my whole team that I was on of 26 people got let go one day. Um, and I had a photography business and still do. And that, no, so I said, well... Now I'm a photographer and, you know, going from working in a cubicle in a salary job to being self-employed, once you read Cashflow Quadrant, you realize that's not better. That's actually worse because you're paying a higher level of taxes. You're putting more hours in likely, you know, the old saying entrepreneurs are the only ones willing to put 80 hours a week in for themselves instead of working 40 hours a week for someone else. Well, I was living that because running your own photography studio, um, is takes a ton of hours so you know i thought well i'm just going to do that full time but on the active to passive income sliding scale that's a photography studio being self-employed pegs the needle on the active side so it's the one of the worst ways to generate uh passive income you can't do it i mean I, there's no way i can scale a business up and walk away ever so that made it even more clear that I needed to figure out a way to generate passive income. And now having the flexibility, even though I was putting tons of hours in, I had more flexibility with my schedule. So I knew I could do some of the tasks needed, you know, going looking at properties, um, doing rehabs and things. I would have some extra flexibility with my schedule to be able to accomplish some of that. So that is really what sparked it. And then I had prepped myself and gotten ready 
with all the education I'd been consuming. So now when I look at a property, you know, because it's all about what it's going to rent for, what it's going to sell for when it's fixed up, right? Those two numbers are what determine your costs and what you can pay for it and work backwards from there. So now I had prepped myself and, you know, between working with, with you, Jack, and getting all of our formulas together, I was able to evaluate properties quickly and tell, determine whether something truly is a deal or not. And that is really the key. Um, so that confidence level went up. But the other thing was I wasn't afraid to just get out there and do it. And I was willing to make some mistakes, you know, uh, even if I may have done some things wrong on the first deal that I ever did. It's still a performing property, and I have some equity built up in it only after owning it for a year. So that turned out to be a great, great deal. Um, so the key was just getting out there and, and you know, getting, like we say, get off the bench, get in the game, right? That's the key. You know, otherwise just another year is going to go by. So really my goal is to aggressively build my passive income and us together to the point where, you know, it meets your expenses. And when that happens, you're financially free. So that's, that's my goal. That's everyone's goal who's probably listening to this podcast. Um, I was one of those people when I consumed tons of podcasts, you know, a couple of years back, building up to this, this moment. So that's really why we're recording these now, just to, you know, help keep people in that mindset of really wanting, you know, to get your mind in the right place where you're prepared to go out and, and get it. I think what's I think there's a bigger lesson there that uh, we kind of zipped over a couple of times. You mentioned it. That first deal you had. Mm -hmm. the, the key to it is that perseverance, because a lot of people would have had that first bad experience, and that would have been the end of it. What made mm -hmm. you decide, like, why you, you didn't let it derail you on that? Right. Yeah, and that's another thing that well, and just through all the consumption of education personal empowerment type stuff and real estate, a common theme that is everywhere in this stuff is persistence and grit. The ability to, when bad things happen, you just pick up and keep going. As long as you have your compass set to true north and you're, you're headed towards your goal, you just do not stop. So I just basically, I, I'm figuring I'm not smarter than them, the people that are successful doing this. If they say, don't give up and just keep going, that's what I'm going to do too. So, you know, when I would get outbid on, on deals or something would happen, you know, there'd be something going wrong during the rehab process or, you know, you're dealing with rental inspector or tax people or something goes wrong. You just, rather than say, well, this sucks, I'm just going to get out of it. You just say, well, how am I going to fix this? You know, there's a whole victim mentality kind of in society right now with a lot of people and, you know, any successful investor or entrepreneur will tell you that that is not going to work in, on, in your favor. You do not play the victim and say, you know, you're responsible for your own success. And that's what keeps people in nine to five jobs is they think, well, I'm not capable of, pr of producing a life better than this. So I just am lucky to have this job and I better just stay in it. Whereas most entrepreneurs and people that are trying to achieve financial freedom, they th they think beyond that, bigger than that, and they have the confidence to pursue that. So uh, that's really a key is, you know, if you get knocked down eight times, you got to get up nine, right? And just keep doing it. And if you have that level of persistence, I mean, you, you almost become an unstoppable force. And I guess that's something I've always had sort of in me a, a little bit. Even as a as a kid, you know, when I would get something in my mind, I would if I was, if I wanted to figure out how something worked, I would take it apart and do it. Even if you know it might have been the smartest idea at the time, I mean, I wrecked a lot of toys when I was a kid taking them apart. So uh, that's something that was sort of innate in me, and then it just got reinforced through all the education and you know podcasts, personal empowerment materials that I consumed. <clears throat> so. That's kind of my story. Um, you know, in the last week we talked about, you know, the corporate world, you know, being allegedly safe. And it's really, that's an illusion. And, you know, I lived that being let go. And I, I thought, and I really had a crossroads too, because I got recruited immediately to get another desk job, like two weeks after I got fired. And they were offering me more and more money to stay. So, I mean, it was literally like, okay, what do I do? Am I going to take the corporate road and just keep going down that road? Or am I going to, 
try to break free here. And I, I said, well, I can always go back and get an IT job in the future if I need to. So I'm going to just go for it. This is my chance to uh, be fully free, uh, be my own boss. So that's that's I just went with it. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you had a really good story. Um, in fact, I, I'm not sure if you even share, shared the uh, that first deal with me up until now. Oh, 12 years ago? Yeah. You know, we we have the ones locally. <laughs> I know all about everyone, everything locally here. Yeah, that was that was a bad deal. I mean, I literally did everything wrong. And this is something that it makes me more cautious, more conservative now, which is good because when we're running our numbers, we're always on the conservative side because you don't want to desperately get into a deal just to have a deal. And that's what I did. I mean, I think it was like the first place that I looked at, I bought it, got, accepted the first tenant that called me because I was so desperate to get a tenant in there. And I mean, I don't think I even knew my monthly cash flow. I just thought, well, the mortgage is 400 bucks. She's going to pay me 700 or whatever the rent was. That's more than the mortgage. I mean, it was like black and white wrong, up and down the street wrong, always wrong. So, uh, you know, that was just, I was so eager. So I had, uh, that part was good that I was eager, but you have to temper that with some knowledge and wisdom and do it smartly. So that's hopefully what we've done ever since. Um, you know, you prepare yourself to be able to run your actual numbers and, and know what's really going on. So that's something we see, you know, in other people too, that are just getting started. Um, you know, you see that look in their eyes that they're just so hungry for a deal they're willing to make a bad one just to have a deal on the books. And here's where it gets weird because, you know, you were saying, get off the bench, get in the game, just get out there and do it, take massive action. Well, that sounds like just get out there and get a deal at all costs, right? But I mean, you have to, what it means is figure out your standards that you'll accept, your minimum, you know, uh, deal standards or whatever you want to call it, uh, what you consider to be a good deal, figure that out and then aggressively pursue that, but don't accept less. You know, so that takes even more persistence because you have to weed through a lot of bad deals or lose deals to other people who are willing to pay too much, in our opinion. Uh, that happens a lot, too, especially, you know, Fargo's a hot market right now. Prices are very inflated. I wouldn't call it a bubble, but <clears throat> I would just say we're at a, a peak uh, as far as pricing goes locally. So, you know, you're going to lose out on some deals because people are willing to overpay. So that's something you just have to be okay to walk away from it and just keep submitting offers and know that you'll get some, you know, you get some winners in there. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really important lesson. Mm -hmm. There's, um, when we're talking, we, we use our analogy, the REI rookies and we'll say get in the game and we're using all of these terminology, but frankly, you know, anybody playing the game, you have to, I don't care what kind of game it is, you're going to prepare for that game. Mm -hmm. Whether it is, if it's just a board game, you're going to set out the board, you're going to put up the pieces, you're going to do some, some basic work ahead of time. So I guess that's going to be one of our biggest lessons or biggest pieces of advice we could possibly give mm -hmm. is, like you said, we want everybody to get into the game, but please take a moment and, and prepare and just to, to run with the cheesy analogy of preparing, I mean, for every strike that you see a pitcher throw, I mean, how many times are they in the bullpen or the, you know, over wherever the pitchers warm up, just warming up constantly. And, you know, all the amount, amount of hours of practice prior to them actually entering the game, you know, there's a lot of preparation there. So, you, you know, you have to know your stuff, know your numbers get your formulas figured out so you recognize a good deal when you see it so you don't just jump wild-eyed into the first deal you see. So that's that's really the the point of my story and it's something I had to learn the hard way. But I didn't let it, like you said, I didn't let it derail me. I just uh, got right back in there because I was confident that real estate was a pathway to what I was looking for, you know, financial freedom. So I wasn't going to let one bad experience deter me from that and there will be others i mean that's something that we discuss all the time right you know I, we've gotten lucky had some pretty good deals but i say look we're gonna have a stinker or two it's coming you know you're gonna buy something and there's gonna be some surprises you know, 
so, in some deals, you're probably you're going to lose money. It's just the you know the odds are in favor of that happening. So, but is that going to destroy us? Is it going to detract us from our mission? No, we're we're just kind of okay. Chalk that one up to a learning experience. You know what do they say? You're either earning or you're learning, right? So even when you lose money, well, just consider that a lesson. You know, you you paid for a certain amount of education with that money. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one a way good to, point. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, well, every every uh, week we're going to uh, go through a, a couple other uh, sections of our podcast, and uh, the next one up will be the lesson of the week, and it's going to be real estate specific, and uh, it's going to be coming from a lesson from a rehab that we just did in Moorhead, Minnesota. And this is this is just on the river. In Fargo, Moorhead is is kind of a a unique situation here in this part of the world. We have Fargo is the larger city. Most people know Fargo, North Dakota, but there's another sister city just across the river, Moorhead. Yep, so it's all one big metropolitan area. So we had a three bedroom rambler that we bought pretty cheap and it was cosmetically pretty bad inside and you know we put all new paint and, and carpet and flooring and everything throughout. Looks really nice. And we it had some decent countertops in it. They were kind of beige. And we changed the color scheme, uh, you know, to gray and gray walls and white trim. And we just went back and forth. What do we do with this countertop? It's kind of, it's you know, it's like a cream color. It doesn't work anymore. It's um, But, man, countertops are expensive. You know, how are we going to... Is that worth putting the money in? And what we discovered was if you just get the mass-produced, off-the-shelf countertops from Menards, they look great. I mean, if you're not talking a high-end house, and this is a house we ended up selling for 135000 so, you know, that's that's a pretty uh, below average. You know, the average, the median ho- ho- home price here in Fargo is right around 200000 So in that price range... Just having new countertops, they look really, really good, and they're surprisingly cheap. It only costs us a few hundred dollars. I mean, but if you're looking at quartz or granite or something, you're talking thousands, and that's something we weren't willing to spend. So that's our lesson of the week, real estate specific tip of the week. Just check out the Menards countertops, and the bonus to that is in our listing, we got to write new countertops. Okay, it's not new quartz, it's not new granite, but it says new countertops on the listing, and that is an attractive thing to buyers, and they look really good. So, I mean, it's don't discount those, you know, if even if you might want something better in your personal house, don't get too wrapped up in that. Just you got to think about, am I going to get my money back by doing this? And we knew we needed to change the color. We thought about painting them. That was going to be labor intensive, may not stick very well, resurfacing them somehow. Uh, so we were surprised to learn how cheap these Menards countertops were. So check them out, your basic big box store countertops. Yeah, they, they were. They do look good. And what I think was one of the most notable uh, marketing part of, of the whole thing was when our agent went in and t- took photos. They really stood out. They mm-hmm. really made a crisp, updated kitchen yep. happen in a, in a very quick time frame and and low cost exactly and that is your lesson of the week so on the on the coach's corner since this was uh, josh's episode we uh we're gonna focus on a book that uh, he really found beneficial last week we talked about uh, rich dad poor dad in stage number two of that yep so Every week we're going to talk about, uh, in the Coach's Corner segment, something d- not real estate specific, but something in a more of the personal development side of things. So in keeping with the Robert Kiyosaki theme from last week, which was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, well, this book is called Cash Flow Quadrant. And this is, you know, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad kind of turned the light on in my brain for, uh, you know, escaping the rat race and, you know, achieving financial freedom. And the cash flow quadrant really lays it out there. You know, it talks about, well, the two kinds of people that are earning money working for others or working for yourself. 
you know, you're never going to be free. It's active income versus, you know, on the good side of the quadrant, which is business owners and investors. So those are the people that can actually step away from their business, take long vacations, have the business survive without you, your day to day input. Um, so that's really a switch that needs to be flipped in your brain if financial freedom is something you want to achieve. So highly recommend Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant Guide to Financial Freedom by Robert Kiyosaki. Check that out. I'm holding the book in my hand. I'm giving it to Jack to read. Uh, it's great on Audible as well. There you go, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, you can find us. Uh, if you have any questions for us, Please look for us on Twitter at REI Rookies, and uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on that and try to answer questions. Uh, we probably may not be able to answer you directly, but we will try to, uh, if we see a trend, we'll, we'll address them in the podcast. And remember, uh, we are rookies at this. We don't claim to know everything, and that's kind of the whole magic, hopefully, uh, of this podcast is that we're learning right along with you guys and with everyone else out there, and we thought... It would be a great perspective to share from, you know, some some newbies in the business as well. And, you know, the only thing that we're even newer at than, than real estate investing is broadcasting and podcasting. So, you know, excuse any uh, polishing that needs to be done there. Um, but we're doing our best here. We got two microphones set up on a table and we're rocking. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that goes for uh, saying that if you do have any suggestions for us, whether, whether it's for our podcast or if you, have, if you are a veteran looking to share some information or insight, we'd like to chat with you or, or uh, take those suggestions firsthand. So you bet. please uh, send anything our way uh, via Twitter or uh, you can uh, see some links to contact us directly in the show notes. Perfect. All right. Well, I think we can wrap it up for today. That's kind of my story. Last week, uh, episode one was Jack's story of how he got into real estate and what fires him up. So uh, from here on out, we'll just kind of uh, have all kinds of different topics, uh, everything about real estate investing So and our journey in it. So remember to get off the bench and get into the game. We'll see you next time. Bye. And my phone died. <laughs> We're rolling. <laughs>